I'd like you to turn with me, please, again to the book of Ezekiel, and this time to chapter 1. The prophecy of Ezekiel and chapter 1. Reading from verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Now, look please at chapter 3. Chapter 3 and uh, verse number 12. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and uh, a noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And further down to verse 22, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Kibar, and I fell on my face. Chapter 8. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld and lo a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. Now chapter 33. Chapter 33 of the same book, please to follow the theme that is before us. And verse 22, Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening of four. He that was escaped came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning. And my mouth was opened and I was no more dumb. Now move with me please to chapter 37. Chapter 37 Verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Finally, chapter 40. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth day, in the fourteenth year, after that the city was smitten in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was as the frame of the city on the south, and so on. The Lord grant us blessing through the reading of his word with all that has gone before in his precious name. Those that read their Bible carefully will know that almost 40 times in our Bible we have the expression, the hand of the Lord. 
those references, those mentions of that important expression would uh, demand your attention and, of course, your consideration. And as you ponder each mention, you will find that possibly they could be classified into at least five different subjects. The first and the last mention of the expression indicate that the hand of the Lord in passages in the word of God solemnly denotes judgment. Judgment. Exodus 9 and 3, Acts chapter 13 and verse 11, the first and the last mentions of the expression in our Bible denote that the hand of the Lord, beloved, does signify and it does indicate judgment. Again, if we were reading from Ruth chapter 1, for example, for, uh, 2 Samuel chapter, four, uh, chapter 24 and verse 14, 1 Samuel chapter 21, no, chapter 14 and verse 21, you will find that those references and others signify chastisement. Chastisement. Possibly the most familiar of those that I have used, to which I've referred, is the one in which Naomi herself testifies that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And she is indicating very, very clearly the consciousness of the hand of the Lord in chastisement. That's a very solemn thing, a very serious issue, and one that I'm sure each of us have genuine reasons to be exercised because there would be very few of us in the meeting at this moment of time, but in one way or another, and for one purpose and another, are conscious of the hand of the Lord upon us in chastisement. When we would come, for example, to Ezra and read in chapter 7, twice in that chapter, you will notice the hand of the Lord denotes encouragement. Encouragement. That's a wonderful chapter. As most will know, it has got to do with the, not the building of the temple, but the beautification of the temple. And we thank God that not only is it our interests to build an assembly for God, but surely, beloved, it is our desire to beautify it with those moral excellencies, the truth of which has been brought before us very thoroughly in these conference gatherings. There is a verse in the Proverbs, chapter 21 and verse 1. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. That's not the only verse that indicates the thought of management. The ordaining hand of God, the controlling hand of God, even in the hearts of men, be they kings or paupers. Now, I just mentioned those as an introduction, trusting that it will interest your mind and heart to look at the occasions in which this tremendous expression is found in our Bible. Now significantly, and I was encouraged by our brother opening with the prophecy of Ezekiel this morning, here we find Ezekiel referring seven times to the fact that the hand of the Lord was upon him. We will not have time, of course, in this meeting to deal with them, but I do trust, beloved, you will take time to examine each of the occurrences wherein Ezekiel testifies to the consciousness of the hand of the Lord upon him. 
I think as I examine the seven occurrences, they present another classification. Not only would it indicate encouragement, but I'm perfectly sure, beloved, it denotes enablement. Enablement. And when we have listened this afternoon and this morning to the high reaches of divine truth that involve us in moral complexity, no, that involve us in moral conformity, each of us realize that we cannot accomplish these exhortations. We cannot acquire these tremendous experiences unless we are empowered by a power outside of ourselves, and that power is divine. But thank God, that power is resident within us in the presence and in the person of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, who would today bring into your experience and bring into my experience what is symbolized in the expression, the hand of the Lord. In this connection with Ezekiel, it denotes power. It denotes divine enablement under circumstances that are very, very intensive. But circumstances that because of their presence and record in your Bible and in mine prove to be exceedingly instructive. Instructive. And so I just want you to think of some of them. As I say, we couldn't possibly cover all of them. But we have heard already today that many of God's people, and I'm perfectly sure, many in this audience undergo and are undergoing some of the strangest experiences they could ever imagine. And wasn't it heartwarming to listen to our brother remind us that soon the night will be over. Soon the wilderness will be covered. And soon those experiences will give way to something extremely different. But in the meantime, we are passing through perhaps something that is turbulent. Turbulent. The turbulence here is indicated by the whirlwind. And you will know in this country more than we know in Malaysia that a whirlwind can be very, very destructive. Very destructive. But thank God, in the passage from which we have read this afternoon, this whirlwind is not destructive, it is instructive. Now, God can change your very, very difficult circumstances that seem like a whirlwind intent on your destruction. He can so enable you by his power to experience his hand upon you as to bring you to see that the cloud is radiant. That the experience is real. And I find that's where this dear man is in this chapter. If we were to examine his circumstances, we could write over it disappointment. For was he not a priest born? He was. I wonder, did he not intend in his early day and expect that the moment would come when he would function for God according to the law of God? I'm sure he did. Being born in a priestly family, he had that privilege. He had that expectation. I would think the mention of the 30th year and the opening expression of this chapter is referring to his own age. The very time when he would come into the very place and function for God. 
But he's not there. He's far away from it. He's not in the place where he expected to be at this time. He's not exercising the privilege that he expected to exercise for God. And you know where he is. He's in a strange land. Facing the dethronement of his king. Facing the debasing of the sanctuary. And all those things that are here in this chapter and in these chapters of Ezekiel. I don't know, beloved, how your circumstances are today that may just compare with what's here. Maybe that you're passing through what seems to be a most frustrating experience. So devolving upon you is the pressure that you feel it's just like a destructive whirlwind. But listen, in spite of the turbulence, the Lord is in control. The hand of the Lord was upon him. Notice what we have heard and what we see now is this. That the word of the Lord came expressly to him. Not beautiful? And I would love to think that in your circumstances this afternoon, however, however incredible they may seem to be, they're bringing you into the invaluable experience of the empowerment of God, the hand of the Lord is upon you and at the same time bringing the word of the Lord to you in all its wondrous grace and power and suitability that's why we're here that's why we can look back to many experiences of this nature when passing through the turbulence when passing through the trial, the word of the Lord has come expressly. Maybe the brethren ministering unlikely, and it's possibly absolutely true that they knew nothing of your circumstances. And yet, the word ministered was exactly what you needed. And may it be so today, beloved. And surely with the variety of ministry we've heard, your need somewhere must surely have been met by the word of the Lord coming expressly to you. The hand of the Lord upon him. The word of the Lord coming to him. And you notice at the end the glory of the Lord appearing. I love that. Because he has observed the mobility of the throne. Those mysterious wheels. Those mighty wings. What do they indicate? Don't think they're imponderable. Don't be overcome by the ponderous nature of these terms, beloved. You younger Christians... Be encouraged, as we have heard this morning, to read this book and to remember this, that what this man is experiencing is the mobility of the throne of God and the God of the throne to come to where he is. Where is he? He's in Babylon. He's down there with the captives of God's people. And yet, the throne is right there. That's wonderful, isn't it? And you understand that in the New Testament. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It comes to us in our circumstances. And we can come to it, whatever the circumstances 
may be. Now, I want to move quickly and move on, please, to chapter 3. And just have a word here, and probably that's about all we'll have time because of the exercise. But I see quite a number of my younger brethren and sisters here today, and I want to speak to you very, very directly. I have a burden for you in this third chapter. For here is the, 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 uh, the uh, apostle, I was going to say. Here is the prophet, and twice in this chapter, he experiences the hand of the Lord upon him. I want you to see that, that in spite of the trouble, the Lord has still a communication for his people. The Lord has still a communication for his people. I want you to notice in chapter 3, the honey of the sweet roll. The honey of the sweet roll. Take time to read the opening verses of this chapter. And I'm going to ask you, beloved, in the presence of God this afternoon, what really do you feed on? We have been solemnly charged, especially in the morning meeting, with the fact that we are not reading the Word of God. Now that's a very solemn thing to be faced with in a, con in a conference like this. And here it is. Here is this man being told to assimilate the role. To bring it into his being. There it is before him. But he must, as it were, bring it right in to his own experience, into his own soul. You have a book in your hand. I'm asking you with all the exercise of my heart this afternoon, do you know the sweetness of this role? Are you assimilating it? more than your necessary food. At least three times a day you sit at a table perhaps and naturally sustain the body. Isn't it incredible that very few of us perhaps have opportunity or take opportunity to feed upon the word of God three times a day. Such is our weakness. Years ago, I suppose, we were noted as men of the book. And I don't want to be insulting. It's probably that we're now men of the bank book rather than the book. Could be. I don't know, beloved, what it is, but there is something that is hindering our younger brethren and sisters from the attachment of a desire and a devotion and a determination to feed upon the Word of God. I want you to notice, please, in verse number 24, what will contribute to that. The honey of the sweet roll, I want you to see the privacy of the shut door. The privacy of the shut door. That is probably where the whole thing is falling down. These are days of socialization. Are they not? How many of us will go from this conference convicted through the ministry? and would be prepared to close our door in the secret with God. Many a time I did that. Glad to get home from a conference in which we heard the voice of God, in which the issues were determining so pressingly upon our soul that we had to work it out before we slept. The privacy of the shut door. I wonder, do you have that in your experience? Don't make excuses. 
I remember trying to do that with an honored servant of God that some of you, if not all of you, knew many, many years ago. And I wrote Mr. the late Mr. Fred Kundig and said to him, you know, Fred, I find it very difficult right now to get t- place and quietness to study my Bible. I'm just living in a room with my wife and little girl. And I find it very difficult just to get the time and this quietness. And I was perfectly sure I'd get a lovely letter of sympathy back. Sorry to hear about it, Tom. Do your best, won't you? Not with him. Oh, no. He wrote back these words, He that is faithful in that which is least shall be faithful in that which is greater. I'm asking you, young men, with the comfort of the homes we have today, do you know the privacy of a shut door? How are you going to hear the voice of God? How are you going to know the hand of the Lord upon you? How are you going to experience what comes out in verse number 17? Son of man, I have set thee as a watchman, a watchman unto the house of Israel. What does he hear? The responsibility of select stewardship. How is he going to function in this amazingly responsible capacity? A watchman to the house of Israel. How are you going to guide others, beloved? Young men, what interest have you in affecting men and women for God in your workplace? You'll allow me to say it, won't you? I was just 15, 15 years of age. I didn't go to university or, or college. I was just put into industry. And I was only 15 years of age the day I met for the first time Sidney Maxwell. And from the moment I met that young man who was four years older than myself, I never rested till I saw him gathered out to the name of the Lord. Thank God for that. That's what I mean. I'm not going to go into the story. But I mean that with all my heart. That was the only one I saw in that way in my time in industry. Not the only one. How are you going to be like this? You're not reading. You're not shutting the door. You're not appointed in any sense to a a sphere of responsibility. So someone, I don't have the, I'm not concerned about what you don't have, beloved. All that I want you to know is the hand of the Lord upon you. And in the last verse of this chapter, says God, but when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are rebellious house, the ministry of a spirit-filled mouth. The ministry of a spirit-filled mouth. The hand of the Lord upon me. May God bless his word.